nothing adds up here. It, there, it just, it, everything happens too fast. For example, as Tess brought up, Rebecca lives in a humble two-story boathouse. <laughs> you know, how does she pay for it? Owning the world's only lethal vagina is something she gets paid for on the side. I don't, I don't know. I don't well, understand. Well, the licensing it. rights on a lethal vagina. <laughs> exactly. Tremendous. <laughs> it's the back end that you really start to earn money. It's the back end for the front end that you really start to earn Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, sexy time is here. That's right. We're talking about body of evidence on Kill by Kill After Dark. Well, greetings and salutations, internet. It's your old pal, Patrick Hamilton, coming to you once again from the sex castles of Portland, Oregon. This is Kill by Kill After Dark. Now, normally we talk about a horror movie and the characters they're in and the terrible ways they die. Uh, here, we're talking about uh, a quote-unquote erotic thriller in, in the hopes that one sex victim's end is just the beginning of the jokes we might make at their expense. And as always, there's only one person I trust to clear the courtroom when testimony gets too dirty. The one, the only, Gina Radcliffe. How are you doing today, Gina? I'm just sitting here reflecting on on a more innocent time. I, I'm thinking about <laughs> Patrick. Do you remember yeah. when we did? Do you remember when we covered Jade? Yeah, yeah, I do. I miss, yeah, I miss Jade. Yeah, J- Jade, Jade uh, is suddenly so much so much. So Jade is suddenly so much a better movie. <laughs> I, I I offer I offer my my most humblest apologies to the late William Friedkin and the maybe late if not he should be Joe Esterhaus uh, for, uh-huh. for my my strong opinions on Jade. Right. You, know, all, all, you all is forgiven. Yeah, I mean Jade, as as you noted quite clearly and importantly introduced the virginal ears of San Francisco to the idea of anal sex, something they'd never heard of before. And now uh, Portland is being introduced to the very concept um, of nipple clamps. They had never, it just, it was new. Just, 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 just knocking the wigs off of uh, Portland's elite. <laughs> if this is Portland's elite, it's come a long way, but I don't want to scare you, Gina, because we are not alone. That is right. We have a special guest. Now, you know her as a TV writer for shows like Martha and Snoop's Potluck Dinner Party and At Midnight. And of course, she is an author whose latest book in the Cat Kelly mystery series, Dying to Go, is available right now. The one, the only Tess Rafferty. How are you doing today, Tess? Well, I, I'm still confused from last night's movie, speaking okay. of nipple clamps. Um, <laughs> Be, because it, so many of the establishing shots to me are so obviously Los Angeles and not <laughs> Portland that yeah. when, when like when he says, um, you know, when they when they show the nipple clamps in the beginning and he goes, what are these? And Joe Montagna says they're nipple clamps and somebody goes, oh, he's from Los Angeles. I'm like, are they in Simi Valley? Like, where, <laughs> where, what part of Los Angeles, assuming it's all Los Angeles, because again, it looks distinctly like Los Angeles. Like, where in, where in the Southern California region are they where they don't know what nipple clamps are? <laughs> my fa- um, so my anyway. favorite part of that sequence, though, is when the guy goes, what are, what are these? And the, and Mantegna goes, nipple clamps. And he looks at them like, yeah. But how do they work? Like what part of them goes to the car battery and what part of them goes to me? <laughs> They're nipple clamps. Like the solution to this word problem is in the two words of the name, nipple and clamp. If you don't understand either of those, 
oh God, you're in such worse shape than I ever thought before. It's really self-explanatory. Yeah. <laughs> well, again, go back to to Jade, which I now love dearly after watching this. <laughs> um, you know, they're like uh, uh, David Crusoe had to explain what a fuck chair is to, right. to, to, to these like middle-aged men who just look and look on an absolute befuddlement. I there, there's a weird thing in this where everyone is so focused on the very idea of Madonna uh, being nude in a movie. And they're all like, hey, um, Madonna has a killer vagina. And everyone goes, oh, no, wait a second. This is different than a regular vagina? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This one <laughs> kills people. And, then, and just over the course of an interminable hour and 40 minutes, it's just over and over and over again. And it's just chugging towards a conclusion that the mere existence of Madonna's body will kill you. Yeah, you got a lot of you got a lot of like again, you know, adult middle-aged men, you know, you know, pulling at their collars, looking uncomfortable, and all the women are just absolutely like repulsed by the the, the, the very thought of woman on top sex and, and right. you know, yes. just just so many pearls clutched. It's just the <laughs> like the they make the like completely inappropriate joke in the beginning with the 12 year old son, right? Where he goes, can you really screw someone to death? And I'm like, surely that's not what they're going to base this case on. Like, this seems like really dumb. You know, 12 year olds literally asking if you can do it or not. And it's like a minute later, you're like, oh no, they're actually going to base this legal case with no, (laughs) like they couldn't even, you know, we've seen so many courtroom dramas and legal procedural shows now. We know as an audience, they have no evidence. Like they're not introducing, this is her dealer. Mm -hmm. This is the vial of cocaine with her fingerprints on it. It's like, no, she just fucked him to death and we're going to waste taxpayer money on this. I was going to say, by by that design, they, they, that, by that designation, they're going to have to go back and, uh, sue uh, Rose Nyland for, for, for killing her husband because was that not a gag in the Golden Girls that, that Rose's <laughs> husband died in the middle of sex? Finally, we've connected two of our cultural linchpins. Madonna's body of evidence and the Golden Girls. We've done it, everyone. Full up shot. It's been a fun seven and a half years. <laughs> Nowhere to go but down, baby. Now, Tess, you and I have been friends for for a minute now and um it, it would it would seem odd maybe to someone to learn that we have been friends for a very long time but i've waited nigh deep into this podcast run to have you on but of course i know something that the audience does not know and that is you do not enjoy horror movies no no i don't like to be scared i'm yeah. I am a woman living in America in 2024. I get all the fear I need waking up in the morning. And so while I've oh, while I've penciled you in here and there, I what I've always come back to is, no, remember, Tess does not like horror movies. And so when we decided that we would kind of do this, what we had previously done is kind of a midweek or in-between movie episode sort of exploration of erotic thrillers when I decided we should bring that back, the the first person I thought of to have on as a guest was you, (laughs) because then I could, I could justify forcing you to watch a terrible movie where I knew I could not get away asking you to watch 1981's graduation day. I was pretty sure I could get you to watch this. It's, it's, it's so funny because I had, I was having dinner over the weekend with a number of people I know who really likes, you know, not just scary movies, but also kind of scary, bleak movies, Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. really depressing, scary movies. And and they run the gamut. They enjoy them all. And um, we were uh, my one of whom is a partner of mine who I collaborate with on a certain amount of projects. And, And what we say is like our thing is that she's into the really dark stuff and I'm not. And that's why we work well together. So Somebody had asked, it's just three people at a table talking about all these horror movies and scary movies and bleak, depressing things. And somebody said, what's the worst one you've ever seen? Not worst, meaning most poorly made, but, um, you know, just most depressing, bleak, scary, whatever. And without skipping a beat, three people all go, the Siberian movie. The Serbian movie. That's a Serbian movie. Yeah, I was very close. I've already blocked it out. And 
I, I was like, I don't want to know what this is. Please don't ever tell me about it. Yeah, I, I read the Wikipedia description. You know, that gif of like the guy like slowly closing his, his laptop and moving it away. That was pretty much me. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I have enough to worry about. This This is this is not a an, an, uh, question I need an answer to. It's no, fine. No, no. <laughs> So, you know, I, I, I enjoy uh, my horror movies fun or, or I enjoy my movies bad. Um, yes. But I don't need someone to intentionally just like give me uh, bad vibes. That, that's a bad vibes thing. I, I don't need that. Whereas this film is, is directed by the same guy who had done some rather harrowing films um, Christine F, which is about a, a teenage junkie in Germany, last exit to Brooklyn, which, which is, is which, a, which in, a, in a bizarre change of pace is a good movie. Yeah, it is, but rather dire. And of course, um, something that haunts me to this day, the little vampire starring the kid from Jerry <laughs> Maguire. <laughs> that is uh that's a hell of a filmography there. <laughs> yeah. So it, it brings me no pleasure to introduce the concept of body of evidence. Uh, the poster for the film has a tagline that reads an act of love or an act of murder. I assume they're talking about the case in the movie, not the film itself. <laughs> but one, one could make the mistake. Uh, so I, I tried to do a little research on this because I, I found the film so confounding, but this movie <sighs> So many people want to bury this film <laughs> that there's little to nothing I could find on its production history beyond everyone involved retroactively blaming Madonna for thinking this was a good idea. And then she and then she in turn blaming the director. Yes. And here's the rub. If Friday the 13th was proof, false proof, mind you, that, quote, anyone can run out with the movie camera and make a profitable Halloween ripoff then body of evidence proves the exact opposite of that when it comes to the cultural impact of basic instinct. I have yet to read anything that suggests a single soul on this earth was conceiving body of evidence before basic instinct hit movie screens in March of 1992. And then all of a sudden this became a viable idea. Yeah. And, and it, and it hits or it attempts to at least hit, hit a lot of the same notes that basic instinct does and, and misses by an unbelievable amount. <laughs> it is true. And, and let me, and let me say, I'm not a huge fan of basic instinct, but I do get the impact that it made at the time and, and how it became a whole subgenre of movies. It's, it's funny yeah. because I'm just realizing in this conversation, I've never seen Basic Instinct. I mean, Basic Instinct has a lot going for it. It's incredibly slick. It is the one good script that guy wrote. <laughs> um, it it proposes something that you seem uh, refracted here. Like Catherine Trammell in Basic Instinct and Rebecca Carlson here in Body of, of Evidence are... Two Hitchcock blondes who enjoy some kink and control when it comes to sex. But Catherine, in Basic Instinct, is very smart. And Rebecca, on the other hand, in this film, devises the world's most convoluted way to get away with murder. And then doesn't get away with it. <laughs> it is almost as if the movie were filmed as a response to Basic Instinct to let prudes... And audiences know that women who enjoy sex can still be punished around these parts, and these parts are Hollywood. Now, now I would, I, I'm not going to say that erotic thrillers in general are particularly kind to women, but yeah. this one in particular just hates women. It's it yeah. truly does. I There's, mean, when you have a here, when you have a your when your hero, and and to steal your phrase, Patrick, I put that in in, in dick fingers. Yeah. You <laughs> outright rape someone. Yeah. And and the the takeaway from that is well she had it coming, you know, or or more not so much she had it coming is well how can you can't rape someone like that? Right. There's so many questions. I mean, like I, my mind went down the rabbit hole. Like like what we all know now as a mature going audience is well was there a safe word? Do you know like did they like if she's in the S and M community she would have discussed having a safe word right? So that's like all I can think is that it it is. 
you know, and I, it, it plays to us as rape and it plays to the audience as rape. Um, but on my head, I'm like, like, I just know too much about it, you know, <laughs> I guess for lack of a, like a lack of a better well, yeah, thing. Because you, because you are, you know, like I said, a mature adult, but this movie yes. is, is <laughs> like, like with, with, with Jade, which was, you know, written to, to shock the, you know, the audiences in the Midwest or whatever, who I guess they thought were unaware of the concept of anal sex, you know, here it's, you know, oh, you ever hear about this thing called? BDSM, you know the the handcuffs and the leather and the candle wax and you know all that weird stuff. And it's like, yeah, there's you know a lot more to it than that. But you you're taking such a surface approach to it because your target audience doesn't care about accuracy. It's right. it's no, they don't care. They're never no one else is going to know. But I found myself through, and this perhaps. Uh, speaks to how boring the movie is how, and even how boring the sex is, is I found myself constantly going, wouldn't they have had a safe word? Like when, when Frank Langella is saying that she wouldn't stop having sex with them, I'm like, well, clearly you guys would have had a sex safe word. You right. know? Like, like that's all I keep thinking during the whole thing is. Also, also, I think it's funny that like, you know, apparently, Hey, I'm having a heart attack. Please stop. What's that? Right. <laughs> it, it brings to mind that sequence in The Exorcist where they 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 filmed Reagan in the bed with, with the hardest that would flap her back and forth, and and later it's revealed the actress is going, please stop, please stop, please stop, and everyone else in the room is like, she's doing great. This is awesome. That's the exact <laughs> yeah. reaction we want out of this. Karina Longworth, uh, in her '90s erotica miniseries, you must remember this, compares Basic Instinct. <laughs> to body of evidence thusly, and I think it's an important distinction. Top Gun is to hot shots what basic instinct <laughs> is to body of evidence. It's just that hot shots is an intentional parody. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah, that yeah, that, that this does feel like a parody. It's it's wild how much they are the same thing where Catherine is, you know, is is using sex to kill people, but Rebecca Carlson sex is just involves killing people. If she sexes you too much, you're going to end up dead. Well, well, yeah. and, well, here's the thing, like in, in basic instinct, it's more that she is murdering people or murdered one person in the, in the middle of sex. She like, right. she like stabs a guy to death or right, yes. right in the middle. Here. It's literally, it is so powerfully erotic that they have a heart attack. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's, it's just so such a poorly thought out crime. Yeah. Because it, it really is like, first of all, if he really has a heart condition, there are um, like non detectable poisons and herbs and all sorts of things you could have slipped to him to have given him a thing. It would have been more believable, perhaps, yeah. if you were going to choose like to fuck him to death. <laughs> that you hang around afterwards and act like, oh my God, we were, you know, having sex and he died on me. Can you help or whatever? <laughs> like, like we right. call 911. What? That might not make you look so guilty. Um, yeah, you know? I, feel like, I, feel, I feel like the scenario they are trying to put into the audience's mind is that, like, you know, her vagina is so powerful, it's like clamping down on him, right? And, and he can't like push her off of him or anything. Which, I mean, again, like a, a grown man, yeah, already right, fine. The middle of a heart, you know, a heart attack is very painful, but it seems to me you should have be able to muster enough up enough strength to you know push a slender woman off of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it doesn't it does it just doesn't make any sense and so it spends so much time trying to reinforce the shaky premise that it never really lands solidly it's always just pitched at such a high camp level but it's unintentional camp it's not going for camp it's unintentionally lands there because it has nowhere else to go. And so the movie begins with, you know, clamp the clamps, light the lights. And Madonna is having sex with this guy using the old HBO original series special. It's not TV. It's Madonna riding reverse cowboy. <laughs> Somehow this results in this guy's death. The next morning, DA Robert Garrett, um, 
played by uh, Joe Mitania from Portland's, you know, the south side of Chicago <laughs> portion of Portland. No, he's um, from Los Angeles. That's why he knows what <laughs> nipple clamps are. Yeah, I also don't believe that Los Angeles has a south side of Chicago area. Is that near the valley? Is that down in the South Bay? Where is that? It is such a useless piece of character backstory. <laughs> <laughs> Just why does he have to be from Los Angeles? Because no part of him at any point reads that guy's from LA. It just doesn't. How about you say that's because you're from Vice? But no, everyone is prudish to the point of prosecutorial about this shit. And so he has to be a hard ass about it all. Um, and we learned that this guy, Andrew Marsh, is dead as a doornail. Um, the only, there are only two moments of joy in this entire thing. And the first one was when I saw uh, Lieutenant Drake from Aliens was in this movie as a cop. I'm like, yay! <laughs> Uh, yeah, you think you would think he uh, when you know when he uh, you know when he hooked up with with Vasquez, you, you know you know he had to be familiar with the rough stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. Those two are not having heteronormative sex. I'll just put that out. There. She was just like just <laughs> slapping him right in front of everybody they, and all. They are experimenting with things. They have a they have a relationship unto themselves, and they're adults about it. Uh, this group of people, not so much. Um, it is during this examination of the, the quote unquote crime scene, which is actual crime scene. Spoiler alert. Madonna killed this man with her vagina. Um, <laughs> uh, we meet Joanne Braslow, who is Mr. Marsh's secretary in charge of where his penis goes on any given night. I don't know what his job is. And they never tell us. He's just a random rich guy. He's just, yeah, his, his job is rich. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and she does, it doesn't take her 10 fucking seconds to identify who she thinks is uh, responsible for this supposed crime. And that is Rebecca Carlson as the reverse cowboy in question. And so now we cut to Andrew Marsh's funeral where my favorite part is we see, we see this one local news guy using a boom mic to capture sound as if any news station on earth would run audio snippets of this. On top of that, he's a good 30, 30 yards away from the guy who's speaking, which is not how a fucking boom mic works. <laughs> is he catching natural fucking sound? What is the point of this? And he's so prominently in frame. He is the center of the action up until we meet Frank Delaney, played by everyday guy, William <laughs> Defoe. He's just totes norms to the max, Gina. He, he, here's my, okay, here's why I, I, I lied. I said my, my my biggest problem of many with this movie is that anyone would, would cheat on an in her prime Julianne Moore. Right, you know, yeah. Regar regardless of what kind of unflattering hairstyle they try to give her. I do not, will not for one second by Willem Dafoe ever as as a person who is shocked by the idea of woman on top sex <laughs> <laughs> or, or, you know, having sex in public or, you know, hot wax on nipples or, or anything like that. Yeah. You, know, you know, Willem Dafoe doesn't just have a sex dungeon in his house. Willem Dafoe is a sex dungeon. <laughs> <laughs> Everything about it is so disjointed. It just feels like everybody... It's like having lunch at the commissary coming from a different picture. <laughs> you know, because there's nothing about that kid that makes it seem like he is either Julianne Moore's kid or William Defoe's kid. You know what I mean? Like, and I don't right. mean he doesn't look like him. I just mean like, I don't get, I don't feel either one of them feel per particularly parental to him or what he's doing yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. His ma his main role is basically to show, oh, you know, see how this power she has over this nice family man. <laughs> when they're having sex, Julianne Moore and Willem Dafoe here, it's like, it doesn't feel, I mean, you know, perhaps you could speak to this better than me because I don't have children, but it's like, you guys are going at it pretty long and pretty loud for somebody with a 12 year old kid who's got a lot of questions oh, right but now. That, yes, I agree. Yeah. Also, like, for, yes, it, maybe it's the middle of the day. Maybe he's already on the bus. Who, who can say? <laughs> I, I will say that their kid named Jamie, and I say that, oh, I only know this because they say his name out loud. He's got one line of dialogue. And that one line of dialogue is, 
can you screw someone to death? And then Frank goes, well, you don't have to worry about that stuff that, well, wait a second. When does he have to worry about being screwed to death? Like <laughs> high school, college, <laughs> junior college. When does it come into play? It doesn't because that can't fucking happen. And then Jamie <laughs> is called back to the heavens. He just disappears <laughs> from the film as he should, because what other what other time would he come in? Yeah, I, I I really think that's his primary purpose is to, you know, well, here's this nice normal guy with a you know, a wife and a kid, and then there's this like, you know, you know sex beast. Who, who's going to you know, lure him away from his boring suburban existence? Also, they don't seem to have a very normal, uh, boring existence. If you're sexing so hard, you've both broken out in a dead ass sweat. I was going like, to say, like, like, you know, are, are you are you implying that they have a boring sex life? Could look pretty good to me. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, no, I'm, I, and plus, like, they're both. It's they're both busy people too, right? Like she, like right. the whole thing is that they don't like she's at the. She's at the restaurant a couple nights a week, which is like, oh, come home one night. I guess we're supposed to think that's his excuse for sleeping with someone else. And he's uh-huh. obviously works late because he's a defense attorney. So it's, I mean, that's a lot of real estate to take up when you both have a child and busy careers. That's a lot of afternoon delight right there. <laughs> and I will also remind our audience that this sex scene uh, was later described by Julianne Moore as so exploitative that she wishes she could burn the negative. She oh just, yeah, she uh, does. She does not. She has not spoken highly of her experience no. in this, in and this I, movie. And I can't me, imagine and me, why. And let me remind you, she had a, a she had a, a glass greenhouse fall on her head in in uh, the hand that rocks the cradle. <laughs> it's a lot of gratuitous nudity. Um, not for the time, because again, we were doing all these things, which you know really kind of started with like no way out and and fatal attraction but it is a lot of gratuitous nudity um for for a character especially who it's like the one who gets cheated on it's like wh- right. why would you cheat on her it, it, this is it's fucking science fiction this movie might as well have people strap on jetpacks and fly around <laughs> from their home to work because it's science fiction fiction why you would go from this to madonna who listen madonna is an incredibly attractive person and i don't want this to be a misogynist fest about evaluating her body or her looks or anything like that i it does have to be said that in this era of madonna her eyebrows have been reduced to mere memories <laughs> <laughs> my I, I, kid I, I, has I, a fuller mustache than she has <laughs> eyebrows in this film no, I'll say it. I I don't think she. I don't think she's at her most attractive here. I think that she is, you know, still leaning hard into the like, you know, you you know, aggressively Marilyn Monroe thing, but like with a kind of you know, kinky edge or something. So I don't un- Marlena Dietrich. Yeah, yes. there's something so unrealistic about her that like. I don't, I don't know. It just, it doesn't, it doesn't really do anything for me. And again, like I said, I, 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 I love Julianne more with my soul and I just can't imagine like being like, Oh, you know, my boring old wife, Julianne Moore, <laughs> you know, forget, yeah. her, forget her. I'm going to go with this one over here. No, they really don't. I mean, it, it's such a stupid plot point that, you know, they don't really like, they don't bother saying anything that might be trouble in the marriage, might be restlessness on his part. It's not like Madonna is, and I don't mean Madonna as an actress. I actually am going to go out on a limb and say, I don't think she's bad in this. And maybe that just speaks to the whole product, but like her character isn't particularly charming. They don't have anything in common. There is just no reason other than this is going to be about graphic um, Hollywood version BDSM and so we have to get them into bed together and it's yeah. I mean he could have been probably what he's doing is already unethical he's fucking his client can I say yes. fucking <laughs> and, um, you know so it's like he doesn't have to be married to be doing something unethical right. <laughs> Exactly, right. and, and I think, I think, I think, and then a, the, the, there's a part where she calls her, you know, Madonna calls her up, and I guess, I guess that's supposed to suggest, that, you know, oh wow, she, you know, she, well, now, now he's getting into dangerous territory. She's letting the wife know about <laughs> about their their relationship and all, and it's like you don't need any of this, right? I, I, it is, it is completely useless, 
if the whole thing is to draw him into the trap of her sexing him so good that he's like, I believe you or I will <laughs> fight until the end of time. He also says multiple times, it doesn't matter if you did it. I don't <laughs> care. I'm going to give you the same defense either way. And she just goes out of her way to be like a terrible fucking witness. Like she's called into the, uh, the, the, the police station and they're grilling her. And because I don't know, this is the sex murder unit and she's okay. just terrible at being a client. She's expanding on answers, admitting to cocaine use, aggressively wearing a beret. <laughs> My God, the number of berets we are forced to see fastened to this woman's noggin. It should be illegal. Oh, I thought I thought the costuming was great. I mean, I think I spent most of the movie fascinated by the, the, her pinstripe suits and her black dresses. <laughs> well, anytime she's styled in the sort of classical Hitchcock blonde thing, it kind of works. Mm -hmm. The beret is out of left goddamn field. <laughs> I don't know where that's coming from. I don't know who thought it was a good idea or they're hiding her roots. I don't know what's doing there, but it doesn't help anything and she's also unfortunately not particularly photographed in the most loving way and for whatever reason when the point of this movie is to go sex goddess madonna is so hot she kills men you probably want to make her look as good as you possibly could i'm just i'm just saying her behavior in the police station is not helped by frank's brinksmanship who says Listen, if you think she really killed this guy with her vagina, uh, arrest her. And they're like, okay, <laughs> handcuffs on. He fucking dares them to do it. And they fucking do it. Like, I would fire this guy fucking immediately. Like, you are bad at this. There's also, I'm not sure why the DA is like, I don't know why the DA is at the crime scene. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. I, and, and uh, it's not, they're literally in an office. They're not in an interview room. So uh, it doesn't even feel like a real, um, you know, real interrogation. And again, he's there again. So it's, it's, I mean, this thing I think is just a sex scene in search of a script. <laughs> right. you, you know, like we want to see all these, all this sex. We've got a German director. Let's use them. You know? yeah. and well, it comes after this. It, this is almost a, a, a triumvirate, a trinity of sex projects for Madonna. You have the erotic album. You have sex, the book, and then this is like the culmin. This is like putting the two things together and they're like, hey, this is everything you ever wanted. And America stood up and said, eh. <laughs> no, no, thanks. I'd rather not. And seeing it all these years later, I we agree. Were good. We, 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 yeah. we, I think we, I think, I, I think we've had enough for now. <laughs> Which really overexposed it to the point where. It just wasn't that interesting anymore. And Madonna has been very interesting before this. And she's been interesting after this, but this is just not a high point in terms of picking projects for her. Now they propose something early on in this movie that um, he, that this dead guy has cocaine in the system. And Madonna's like, we didn't do cocaine together. And so he goes, well, maybe someone slipped him cocaine. And I wrote down what they mixed it in his fucking Afrin. <laughs> I wrote this note in the first 20 minutes and lo and behold, I was right. <laughs> the whole, the old cocaine dose spray. And you know, everyone's kind of mystified as to, well, what is the motive for sex in a guy so good? He dies. Like, what do you get out of that other than bragging rights? And then the motive is finally revealed. Rebecca has been named in the will and could receive $8 million. That's $400 in today's money. <laughs> that won't buy you a boathouse in Portland. <laughs> I mean, you could probably rent a place in Florida for a good two months for that. So, you know, uh, that's the other thing that kind of bothers me. I really wanted, I wanted, I wanted so many things to happen in this movie that didn't. I wanted it to be like, I wonder what reveal to be that she was actually already rich. I'm like, she yeah. has a gallery. She lives in a gorgeous, just beautiful house. Um, yes. You know, I'm like, 
where's her money coming from? Are we meant to, I mean, it doesn't matter. She's a whore. She should die. You know, that's, <laughs> that's the point of this movie, right? Is that what they want you to believe? But it's sort of like, is, is he just fronting all of this stuff for her? In which case, maybe why would she want him to die? I don't know. It's just so, um, you know, like they never really say where her money came from. No, I think they rushed this so quickly into production. They're like, I don't know. She just murders people because she sex is good. And they couldn't green light it fast enough. They just had to make this movie. So absolute howlers that are, that comes out of people's mouths in this film. No one ever thought, is this a good line? Like, Frank, have you ever watched animals make love? <laughs> I honestly never want to hear. You, you know, I have strong feelings about the phrase make love, Patrick. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I think this is like a new one. And I never want to hear anybody say that phrase ever again. No, I'm I'm with you. I wasn't a fan of it before. I'm certainly not a fan of it after I've heard Madonna say it. So <laughs> and say it about what, she, like she's always reduces everything to making love when kind of the, the point of being sexually free is to simply refer to it as sex because you're not always making love. Sometimes this is a physical act. Sometimes this is a, an act of connection, you know, but all every time you, you know, strapped on the a, a nipple clamps, it was making love. I don't know. Um, I've also seen animals have sex. Um, I don't think they have ever made love. No, I mean, no, no <laughs> animal at any point has, you know, cranked up the pesh mode and lit a candle. No. <laughs> You'll never find. Excuse me, I'm going <laughs> to be over here. I'm going to, you know, yeah. just watching like, you know, you know, a rhinoceros put on a smoking jacket before his, before his lady comes over. <laughs> to underline how much of a parody the movie is, as soon as, as soon as Madonna says, have you ever watched animals make love, Frank? I wanted it to continue to be ever hang around a gymnasium. <laughs> Do you like the movies about gladiators? In, it is so high key. It is unintentional camp. They've just reached a level of over the topness that is you, you can only, you can't go into it. And like uh, some movies nowadays of the Sharknado type where like, we're intentionally making a bad movie. Everyone involved in this thought this was basic instinct. Oh yeah, too, oh baby. no, they, this is all very, very much meant to be taken straight, and 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 it's uh, it, it's funny because this is the second time, second thing we've done with Willem Dafoe in it, where he's just absolutely god awful, and and, yeah. and and again, I'm always shocked because he's one of my favorites, and it's just like, man, what are you? And I think a lot of it, again has to do with he is egregiously miscast in this. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, help. And, and he, you know, he alternately looks embarrassed and uncomfortable, and, and, and at the same time, a little too into it, which which which, which, <laughs> which kind of belies the whole. Oh, I've never done anything like this before. I grew up in a cornfield, in Idaho, or something. You know, I mean, right. you know, I'm handcuffed <laughs> during sex. What? It's one of those things where, after so much exposure to Willem Dafoe. I do honestly believe when he looks into a mirror, the green goblin talks <laughs> back to him. Like, <laughs> absolutely. When Frank and Sharon are having sex, they they make it so athletic that it almost appears like they're having Greco-Roman missionary sex. Like at any point, Julianne Moore might suplex him into the bathroom. <laughs> and, and again, it's like, okay, you know, what about this sex life is boring that he has to find yeah. himself drawn to someone like Rebecca. But everyone else is is constantly labeling every part of this is absolutely aberrant. Like uh, Joanne drops in to let us know that Rebecca and Andrew use toys during sex. <laughs> what will look suspicious next? Flavored condoms? What are we doing here? Are we not fucking adults? Yeah, I mean, like, like Ann Archer is just, again, it just, you know, constantly a, a hand in her throat clutching pearls. I wanted it to be her just to keep it thematically with every movie you see her in. And she's really the secret murderer. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Mostly because I only know two movies now that she's been in. <laughs> and you know, and you know what, honestly, if they, you know, had gone the way that they appear to be leading the audience towards in that, I don't know if it would have made it a good movie. It would have made a better movie than this though. Any improvement would have been an improvement, but I think they're racing so quickly to a finish line. No one thought about 
why they were sprinting so hard and <laughs> what they were, the steps they were taking to get there. No one thought, um, was the end worth it? <laughs> right. It, during another conference, um, Joanne is asked a question about, well, if you saw Rebecca using cocaine, why didn't you tell your boss? And she responds to it. Well, it's not my job to tell my boss his girlfriend is a cokehead slut. That's right, Joanne. That's HR's job. <laughs> I mean, I, f- I feel like that you actually is kind of your job to maybe warn your boss like, hey, uh, you know, like, you may want to check and see if you know she's using cocaine because that might look bad on you. Well, yes. I don't know. Maybe the rich guy likes cocaine. <laughs> That's right. also true. Yes. That is also true. It, he, he likes sex toys. He likes nipple claims. He likes cocaine. Hey, you know what? Sometimes your boss is a person who uses nipple claims. I'm sorry that you need to know about it. And that's also something you should take to HR. Um, along, yes. Sorry. I don't want to give any spoilers out if anyone's following along with us at home. Um, no, screw that. Give a spoil it away. I do, I do like the part where the ER doctor comes in and we can delve into more of this later, but it's like, he, you know, they're like the, he came in and he was doing cocaine <laughs> and he, he told me it was his first time and that he was never going to do it again. And I'm like, how many times have you heard that in the ER? <laughs> <laughs> oh, but this was the one time it was true. Is that the rich yeah. guy's never done coke before? And this was just an accident. doctor. <laughs> like he slipped and fell into cocaine yeah. is the way it is presented here. Like it was simply by accident. Um, spoiler alert, it was not an accident. Um, and it's just like every conversation in this movie is set to random. It's like they put <laughs> it's like they put all of the script notes and the dialogue into a big bingo bin and turned it around and pulled out the next line of dialogue for somebody and hand it to them. It's revealed. That cocaine is 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 involved here, and Frank's all pissed off about it. And Rebecca goes, "Come with me," and they head <laughs> off to God knows where. And we meet Doctor Navarro, who runs an apothecary so dank and smoky that one assumes he also sells loose mogwai <laughs> in the back. <laughs> oh yeah, of course you've got the you know the 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 the. Your mysterious Asian flair, which is also again now. I say I keep bringing up Jade. Jade actually came out after this, right? So I I cannot believe that they lifted anything from this. But I mean, I guess in some way, you know, a, a little bit of you know uh, column A of Basic Instinct, a little bit from column B of this. Even though this movie was a fucking flop. The crazy thing is, Gina, is that Jade, for as convoluted and truly stupid as that film is makes more it sense does, it does this. make more sense and and you know even though it's you know it kind of sets up the the uh the killer to be exactly the person you think it is the entire time no matter no matter you know how many red herrings it tries to throw at you like here it's like right. okay you know, yeah again it's it's the person you think it is the whole time and then they have this last bit no it isn't oh wait but yes it is so <laughs> yeah it's just it's just so incompetent well, it's like, like all those italian acupuncturists out there exactly <laughs> dr navarro master of chinese medicine <laughs> <laughs> what what why can't you there has to have been a asian actor in all of portland you could have called upon or even bust one up from a different area i don't know they're available dial a phone but no this very anglo guy is just gonna stab madonna in the butt with some needles <laughs> so they they explain the cocaine away that somehow she's using this other route as uh as 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 an aspirin because you know you know it's very easy but, to take stuff that, that comes up as cocaine on a, on a, on a right. drug test but why does she have to fucking snort it like I'm sorry. What are you injecting between your toes? Oh, this is anti-diarrhea medicine <laughs> that I injecting between into my, the veins of my eyeball because that is where it is most effective. Well, if you're desperate, you'll do. 
had a migraine, Patrick. <laughs> I, I, I might be interested. I, I might. I, I, I might be willing to 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 inject myself in my eyeball with cocaine. If you got <laughs> diarrhea at the wrong time, or even I don't know, at the right time, I suppose you'd, you'd probably try sticking something between your toes just to get it to stop. Sure. Okay. Well, you, you know what? I was a doubting Thomas, and you guys pulled me right back around. Well, I'm here it, to but, listen. You know, it's it's a great plot point if the whole thing, I guess, is just to deflect attention from this. You know, to I guess it, it, it to discredit the witness and say, no, it wasn't me doing cocaine. Um, or you could have just not done cocaine in front of people if that was your plan all along to kill right. them with cocaine. <laughs> like, yes. You know, that Again. seems like it would have perhaps been a, like, I feel like the whole, all these little plot twists are set up to be like, this is how smart she is that like, you know, when she gets brought up on charges for murder, everything can be explained. But it seems like the really smart killer would not have gotten brought up on charges for murder. Right, yeah, she's exactly. like a little too confident in all her alibis. <laughs> like yeah. in all the right. various like explanations she has set up for things. Or you could and, have just not gone, like you could have found a better way to kill him. <laughs> on a Vintage Video Podcast, we'll be reviewing every single wide release of the 1980s in chronological order. Over 250 episodes to enjoy and thousands more to come. John enters the store now to order another can of ether. I picture him outside like Homer with the gas hall. <laughs> when for you, when for me. I also like to think about that the kids renew their vow not to talk about the murder. By, by murdering someone. <laughs> They're taking a blood oath with someone else's blood. This stuff is seven times more powerful than uranium. Yeah. They, they open up the vault that is contained and not wearing any kind of protective nope. gear. Yeah. And it's wooden crates. Wooden crates. It's like the guys in Chernobyl picking up the graphite rocks yeah. and going, man, because there's rocks. Hugging the elephant foot. <laughs> just like, oh, this thing's smooth. It's so warm. He turns to dial the number from the classified ad without even thinking about the numbers. <laughs> we know this because we can hear his thoughts and he's talking about how AJ was right that ninjas are misdirecting him. They're misdirecting him. I really wish that he'd turn to the front of man like, six, six, five, five. <laughs> <laughs> two, five, two, five. Vintage video. We're rewatching the 80s so you don't have to. Nothing adds up here. It, there, it just, it, everything happens too fast. For example, as Tess brought up, Rebecca lives in a humble two-story boathouse. <laughs> you know, how does she pay for it? Owning the world's only lethal vagina is something she gets paid for on the side. I don't, I don't know. I don't well, understand. Well, the licensing it. rights on a lethal vagina. <laughs> exactly. Tremendous. <laughs> it's the back end that you really start to earn money. It's the back end for the front end that you really start to <laughs> 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 Out of nowhere, bum bum, the the trial begins. Just like this is the speediest ass trial. I was gonna say in, in true, ever been in in true trial. like you know, movie and TV trope fashion, she gets arrested and goes on trial like a week later. And and I, I can tell you with some authority, I work for a criminal defense attorney who hopefully has never had a a passionate affair with his client. I really don't want to have to think about that. Um, <laughs> Uh, it can take literal years before you before you go to trial on something. Well, yeah. they're they're trying to do this like you know clearly because also it's like the the second scene right is is the funeral again if he, if he died under sub a suspicious circumstances that would have taken a while to put together because there would have been the autopsy and everything. But it's mm -hmm. like it's like clearly they they took two tropes from that era of filmmaking, which is sex and courtroom drama. And they were like, this is all going to be like courtrooms and cunnilingus. Like, that's it. Like, get into the courtroom and get the conjugal things down. You know, the carnal out. Like that, that's literally all they cared about is like, we're going to make a courtroom drama when they're not in court with their gotcha questions. They're going to be fucking and nothing else. going to be a sexy <laughs> courtroom drama. What we've all needed. And so... For opening statements, you have the DA going, this woman owns a lethal <laughs> vagina. And Frank gets up and goes, not so much. Bum, bum. And that's it. It's over. And so uh, the next the next day, they're right back in court. This is where we learn the Afrin was dosed with fucking cocaine. And I literally had to put the computer down and walk away <laughs> for like 20 minutes. I, I had to touch grass. I had to see the sun. And then they, 
they go through a rather elaborate process to let us know something that having sex on cocaine is like holding a loaded gun to your head cracks egg into frying pan. I mean, I'm sure that, that using cocaine under any circumstances would, would be like holding a loaded gun to your head. Very true. I mean, there's never, there's never any, there's never any circumstance where using cocaine is one of the things. <laughs> Well, no, it's all it's so natural, though. Gina, it's a plant. It comes from the earth. <laughs> There's someone out there who's like doing doing cocaine right now, but won't get a vaccine. You know, so exactly. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, we're we're told this information by Doctor Paley, and for those of you saying there's a whole lot of fucking doctors in this sex law movie, <laughs> you're right. Um, Doctor Paley is played by Jurgen Prock now, and if you're guessing. Well, that sounds like he's going to end up being a bad person in the end. <laughs> You're right. Didn't take you long to guess that one. This movie cannot cast people who don't seem like they already have a dozen motives just <laughs> sitting in their back pocket. But he testifies that Marsh, as Jada noted earlier, came into the hospital for cocaine poisoning, like he sprinkled too much of it on his mashed fucking potatoes. You mean an overdose? Cocaine right. poisoning? He, you mean not an overdose? An overdose. <laughs> And he did not over. This is poisoning. This was and this. Someone else, you know, gave it to him as a birthday gift or something. And so they put Ann Archer on on the on the stand after him. And in this scene, in particular, her hair officially crosses over into Patrick Swayze circa Roadhouse territory. <laughs> yeah, they do. They they go out of their way and mostly fail to make the other women in this movie less attractive than Madonna. So they, they give them, right. you know, what are we going to do? Well, they're both incredibly beautiful, but let, I don't know, let, let's give them frumpy hairstyles. All right. Did everyone. Great. We did it. No one will think these people are as attractive or near attractive as Madonna. And it's like, why, why does it have to be a fucking competition? But anyways, we learned that Joanne was the person who gave Marsh the cocaine before. This is going great. And it's also where I noticed there is a full fucking hour left in this movie at this point. That's okay. 20 and, minutes will be candles. Right. That, yeah. It's of like, what are they going to fill it with? And it turns out it's just long sex that, scenes. That are, so. that are deeply, deeply unsexy. <laughs> I, had to, I had to hit fast forward. I, I was literally like, I and you know, um, my husband was in the background um, and he was like, he had, he's like, I think I've saw this on HBO a couple of times or whatever. And mm -hmm. I was like, he's like, oh no, this is like when they do the thing with the candle wax. I'm like, I, I literally got that. I've seen a candle in this scene for five minutes of footage. Like it's not that, it's not that long of a thing that you need to do in terms of like, you know, can dripping candle wax takes about three seconds. Like does not have to be, uh, it is not, uh, it is not a five minute, uh, worth of film, you thing. could just you could just you could just it's like watching these scenes like someone like 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 repeatedly poking you inside me like it's a sexy right 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 you think it's sexy <laughs> like this is really this is really kinky right look 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 watch watch she's she's gonna cut him she's gonna cut him with some glass that's that's crazy right that that that's super crazy and it's like I sure <laughs> you know it's like yeah. I mean it's right. not you know you know you know, cutting isn't my cup of tea but I understand it's a thing people enjoy so I mean all right sure I, I guess yeah that's that's wild man yeah you're you're really you're I, really just, melting my eyeballs here with the with the you know, the, the the weird sex nine and a half weeks did a better job of like showing the erotic side of similar right. things you know, um, they just did, they just made it boring because there was no, well, first of all, like 80s Kim Basinger and 80s Mickey Rourke, like she's hot and beautiful. He has like charisma for days. Like you're like, I don't care what they do. Right. But there's like these, I feel like with Willem Dafoe and, and Madonna, there's no natural chemistry between them. No, that's, I was gonna, I was gonna say that the thing that makes nine and a half weeks work is they actually now supposedly, you know, in real life, they didn't like each other at all, but, but they have a lot of really believable sexual chemistry where, where here yeah. there's just like, mm, nothing nothing there's no chemistry there's no even basis for it in the script like they get through and i'm i feel like i'm stepping on your thing patrick but they they get through like the first day of court or the second day of court 
and suddenly they're going out for a dinner and it's like this yeah. is supposedly the biggest court case in to hit Portland in you know a hundred years and there's paparazzi everywhere except at this restaurant. <laughs> yeah, why is this like the world's most elaborate meal? Yeah. And at a certain point, a Rebecca reveals that her sadomasochism came from stealing strawberries and being bad at climbing fences. <laughs> oh, okay, sure. And then she also reveals that she just has whips and chains. Dar she can just. Look around the room and see who's into it. And as a result, she's like, look straight at him. He's like, which, who are you here? Is a, who here's a freak. And she's like, I'm not going to tell you because it's depressing. And so they leave and immediately he's like, I want in the house. Let's get into it. And she's like, you have a family. And I'm like, yay. Oh, no. And she left the door open. Oh, no, he's going inside. Yeah. No, nope. now everything looks like a, a Nightmare on Elm Street 4 sensual dojo. <laughs> this isn't going to go well. And then she comes at him from behind like fucking Dracula. And, and, again, and again, I think, I think they're, they're trying to very obviously lift from body heat. Where she just yes. kind of like, you know, oh leaves him God, outside yeah. the house and be like, I'm going to leave you out here. You, 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 you decide what you want to do. I'll be waiting. I'll, I'll be in here either way. Okay, everything we're describing are better movies yeah, in every yeah. way and better pairings in every way. And there's absolutely no point in this where like, wow, I can't wait for Willem Dafoe and Madonna to start having sex. That should be the first question you answer. Who are the two people who you're like, I can't wait for these two to go at it. This is not the pairing. You know? no. It just does not work. And I don't know what Rebecca's sheets must be like after she rips open candle wax and champagne on somebody. But that shit does not come well, out that's of silk. The, that's the funny okay. thing is that, you know, she's such a BDSM expert, but also uses regular candle wax, which, which there is right. actually wax designed for that purpose. That that will that will not that will not severely burn and blister your skin. Uh, he comes out of this with his chest looking like Freddy fucking Krueger, and yeah, and leaving marks that your wife will notice later and think that they are bites. I don't want to come off as prudish, but all I could think of once he once Willem Dafoe gets his arms tied around behind his back by a belt and then put on his back would be that. My arms would fall asleep almost yeah, this immediately. Is, this, is, this, is someone's, this is someone's idea of BDSM, you know, that, that and they have no idea how it actually works. You know, they, they, they yes. think it's, well, it's handcuffs, it's candle wax, it's, it's they hurt the other person, the person, but the person actually really likes it. And 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 they and they do a bunch of stuff without asking them first, which is which is just like rule number one: no, you don't just start pouring candle wax on someone without saying, "Is it alright if I do this?" I mean, you know, I, I realize that if you're watching, that part isn't you know, consent isn't sexy. Yeah. If you've already fucked a guy to death, like what's a few burns? Right, you know, exactly. <laughs> you probably you know, <laughs> you know, beg forgiveness later rather than ask permission. And if you're trying to get away with this murder, why are you setting up your lawyer to look just as guilty in such a way that his wife will immediately notice? Like, Frank, honey, why are your balls all waxy? <laughs> uh, I fell into a honey jar with my fly open. When's breakfast? This is not going to help. And... I am not happy to report to everyone that I answered a question, and that was, can you see too much of Madonna naked? <laughs> and I'm not happy to report, you can. At a certain point, you're just like, okay, she has breasts. I well, get it. And again, as was mentioned earlier, this is coming at the tail end of, of her doing the, uh, the, the, the erotica album and doing the sex book. And it's like, you, you really are. America really was at a, okay, we get it now point with this. Yeah. And, I, and I think that's one of the yeah. reasons why this movie, other than it's terrible, the, this movie did so poorly is like, you know, oh, she's, you know, playing a, 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 a you know, kinky broad who might kill guys or actual, her literal vagina. And it's like, hmm, all right, I, I guess. It's very, <laughs> it just, again, and I know that it's easy to say in 2024, 
Um, but it, it just feels so exploitive, like all of it, mm -hmm. because you know that they're actors really doing it and none of it is so, you know, engaging or compelling that you forget that for a minute. Uh, when he's having sex with Julianne Moore, it's like, you know that she is really an actress who is sitting there just completely naked with him who is completely naked or they've got their patch on or whatever it is. He's got a right. sock or something that you maybe can't see, but they're pretty naked and they're pretty, he's, you know, got his mouth all over her body. And it feels very, um, it, again, it feels very egregious and it feels very um, in, invasive because you're not into the story enough to not care, to be like, oh yeah. no, I'm, this is, you know, this was necessary nudity. This is a great sex scene. And none, and none of these people seem like they care about each other. So it's basically, it just basically feels like you're watching pornography that, you know, given a slightly classy edge to it. It's, it's, it's better, it's yeah. better lit <laughs> pornography. Boom, boom. We're back in court and Dr. Paley's called back to the stay. And it turns out he's the one who, you know, touched Rebecca on the shoulder whom he was dating and said, you see that guy? cocaine would kill that guy and he's rich so you, should, you, and, should, you should set up a long then, con where you get into a relationship with him get him hooked on cocaine and then fuck him to death sounds like a plan if you don't sleep with me um i will testify against you in court and i'm going to do that on a recorded device it just how did this guy pass med school <laughs> yes. he made so many dumb mistakes i mean it's also it's, like what's it's, right. it's the biggest HIPAA violation since, you know, she went to get acupuncture in a place that doesn't even have a <laughs> screen you can't see through. Well, that's okay. He's drawn to that screen by a <laughs> pussy. I'm sorry, a cat. <laughs> so it all makes sense. Okay. So after this victory in court, they get into the elevator and you guessed it. Love it another visa <laughs> happens. And they go to a fucking parking garage. And he's like, we're going to get caught. She's like, don't worry about it. She knocks out a fucking light and then flops him on top of, of the glass laden the, the hood of this broken car. Broken glass. Does, does not even, again, does not ask him, hey, can I do this? No. Before she does it, just slams him down the hood of that fucking car. And also, you know, shoves his face into her crotch in a way that, I'm sorry. His face is in her crotch. There's just no other way around no, it. No, I mean, he's going down on her. Like, quite, yes. like, yeah. Visible. In a very visible way. And listen, I don't want to yuck anyone's yum, but broken glass on a dirty car hood sex is simply not my bag, baby. Yeah. But also, if you're trying to hide this, from your wife when you keep coming back with shirts that are torn open and covered with blood, cum, wax, and broken glass. You can't say it was a bad day in court, honey, because you're in fucking court. This doesn't happen to you. And also, just the idea that, like, he just doesn't care about his professional life. Like, he will get disbarred. Like, he, yes. like, there are, there are newspaper reporters crawling all around this courthouse. <laughs> but no one's following you guys out on the elevator. Like no one, no, yeah, one's, trying, no one's trying to get like you know, a quote or or an, or an exclusive you know interview or anything like that. Nope, they're left completely unbothered to do this. Yeah, they're not hiding out by your car. They don't know which car's yours by now, and they're right. not hiding out to try to you know get you guys like you know caught on tape or something with a, <laughs> like you said a quote. But certainly, this would have been the scoop of the decade in Portland. But this is a world where court TV never existed. So they're just, once they're out of the courtroom, they're alone in the universe. <laughs> and this is where we're back. Then we find ourselves back in court where Jeffrey surprise witness Roston shows up, played by former hot 70s Dracula and his entire career, a sexual harasser, Franklin Jella. She, he shows up. He goes, I knew her and we dated in another city. We were lovers and the entire courtroom murmur, 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 murmur. Like I have the, the audience at the Apollo theater is <laughs> less responsive to stimuli. Yeah. They're, they're, every time someone is. like makes a statement, like they're all like, woo, woo. 
like <laughs> fist pumping and like you know jaws pulling, pulling open and sandman just takes up his his hook and you know hangs it on the wall i won't need this today everyone's entertained as hell he says this and the whole uh, the whole courtroom is a gog like oh well i was under the impression that rebecca was a virgin prior to this trial like <laughs> how is this a fucking surprise but uh, you know nothing gets me hotter than sex in clogged arteries there was no pre-trial more emotions on this case like there was none right like yeah. <laughs> like nobody bothered to say what was going to be admissible or not it was just like hey you guys show up and let's just wing it the DA just like kind of drags all this information out from Frank Langella, who it can do many, many things, but be a shy wallflower is not amongst <laughs> them. So again, another person miscast. It's not like Frank Langella is, can't be a good actor in movie roles. It's just like, why did you hire him to do this? This is when Frank's wife, Sharon, finds out because, of course, Rebecca just called her and pretty much says... By the way, we've been boning. Tell him to bring a fresh shirt tonight. <laughs> oh, by the way, you know, if you'll remember, like, his, his, like, because it happens after this, like, there's, there's just like these back and forth, right? It's like their yeah. point, our point, their point, our point. Every time the, the prosecution gets a good gotcha in, his courtroom, and I mean, Willem Dafoe's courtroom body language is the pits. Like, <laughs> like he basically mon- it just throws every time, like, there's, a bad witness. He like throws his ha- hands up in the air. Like, well, I guess she's guilty. Like he like moves away from her and he gets all butt hurt. And it's like, yeah. you know, that's not a very good, good defense attorney. One who does not have a poker face. It's just like, he's like every TikTok boyfriend watching an NFL playoff game yeah. in the past two weeks. They're just ranting and their, their heads buried in their hands, just reacting so poorly. It's like, you, you're still in the middle of a trial, my guy. Stop doing this. Yeah. So in reaction to his wife finding out, of course, he rampages over to Rebecca's, you know, humble abode, <laughs> her two-story on the water humble abode. And for whatever reason, the music switches over to Low Rent Omen <laughs> soundtrack. Oh, yes. <laughs> Santango. Jeez, Christ, no. uh, is, is one of them going to sprout horns? Because that is the only purpose for that music. And then just if you wanted to know if that this movie is gross, um, it goes out of its way to make yes. it fucking like, gross. Like I said, our, and our yeah. hero and commits rape. What makes me almost angrier, not that the, the initial act does is not angering, but then it commits the sin of her starting to smile halfway through it as if, this is what she wanted all along, part of my master sex plan. And you're like, why? How does this help you? And, How does this help anybody? And, and you know, it doesn't make this any less problematic or gross. But again, where they drop a ball is, oh, so she's recording him. She's going right. to use this to send him to jail. She's going to right. use this to blackmail him. Like, uh-huh. no, no plot. No. Nope. Yeah, not, not at all. It's just... It's just, we needed to have time to fill. We had to reach 90 minutes. Otherwise, we won't get our completion funds. <laughs> it just bears no point to the ongoing narrative. And then slam back into the courtroom. And it turns out Joanne was having sex with Marsh. And he recorded that. But no one watched the videotape long enough <laughs> to actually see that. Come the fuck on. Yeah, yeah they, they, they watched like the five minutes that they needed to confirm that Rebecca was there. It's like, well, that's all we need. So, yeah. <laughs> and then we Just have to pl- make Ann Archer, like, you know, like dance around naked, I guess, so she doesn't feel left out that every other woman in this movie is being exploited. Like- right. <laughs> <laughs> just a part of the contract is like everyone has to be nude, even if it has nothing to do with the movie whatsoever. So the, the judge in the courtroom has to be naked at some point. Yeah. Frank Lagella has to walk around <laughs> salt burn style. <laughs> Joanne bought the nasal spray that was dosed with cocaine. And everyone goes, yay. And then as soon as they're out of the courtroom, Frank's like, none of this makes sense. He's for, he's for the audience. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm with that guy, that terrible person. This does not make sense. And Rebecca insists at a certain point, I have to take the stand. And I guess because Frank committed sexual battery last night, she's going to get her way. Yeah. So they put her up on the stand. 
what no, no good lawyer would not, ever allow. Do not ever let your defendant testify on their on their behalf. And he's already gi- uh, punching giant holes in the prosecutor's case. But Frank is not a good lawyer. So up Rebecca goes. And like Sharon shows up in court. Frank Langella shows up in court. <laughs> like everyone's still in the back. Yeah, why is why is his wife there? Like like it's the most I, <laughs> like the wife, like Rebecca's in the bathroom before taking the stand, and the wife comes out of the stall, and you're like, first of all, you have a business to run. Like that's yeah. you, like you've got a restaurant that you're running, but you've come here to watch your husband uh, who's cheating on you defend the woman he's cheating on you with. (laughs) Why? What do you get out of it? It's so weird. And then of course they're both in the bathroom and you know, Sharon, I don't begrudge her slaps Rebecca straight across the face. But again, don't slap a sadomasochist if you want to hurt them. That's just teasing. (laughs) Just going to ask, how is Madonna's house a houseboat? It's a mansion that's like by the water, but would you, li- can you like literally drive? It's two stories. As you've said, it's got like a porch, yeah. <laughs> like, but there's a dock to get to it. It is on the water. Can you, it's like a, like a river boat. Like, can you drive it somewhere? Because it doesn't look like it's seaworthy. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's definitely not seaworthy, but in both Seattle and Portland, and even in San Francisco, because in Zodiac, uh, Robert Downey Jr.'s character lives on a houseboat, a, a much more meager houseboat. But it's just like this, it's like a trailer park, but the trailers float on the water. And, that, and that's basically it. But this is the most elaborate fucking houseboat I've ever seen. And, and I that mean, it is accounts for whatever considering who yeah. lives there. By technical definition, it's a house, but I think the only reason they put it on the water is so when she, you know, defenestrates out a second story window, she hits the water. That's it. And we can get him like a nice wet t-shirt shot at the end. I was really hoping that Rebecca, when she's sworn in, put her hand on a copy of Fifty Shades of Grey, but we don't see what book it is. Uh, it, It could be penthouse letters. I don't, I'm not sure. The DA is like... Well, is it isn't it crazy that you dated this doctor and then dated this guy that was seen by that doctor? And she's like, Portland's not that big of a city. It has a fucking NBA team. It's big enough. <laughs> she's like, oh, well, in this previous relationship with Frank Langella, what happened was, you know, why did I get out of the relationship? I walked in on him with another man. Oh, I see. The bisexual did it. Oh, thank God. <laughs> Someone worse than the person into kink has shown up into the movie. Let's let's point the finger at him. So And then he nods oh God. like it's true, which is totally yeah. admissible in a court case. Right. <laughs> Not nodding from the gallery. Yeah. I think that's entered into court. <laughs> the stenographer's like Frank Langella totally nodded, then walked out. So guilt not guilty? I don't know. And then immediately out of this, like she just blows the hole in this hole, you know, of what is just not a real workable case. Yeah. Uh, and she's not guilty. You know, the, the, the jury comes back and says totally hot, but not guilty. And like, everyone's like, yay. And then reporters run out of the courtroom so fast. They knock over the phone booths like an airplane. <laughs> So that and he walk Frank walks out of courtroom is like nothing about this is really adding up. And so he goes to Rebecca's floating manse and immediately everyone in every line of dialogue says fuck. I'm not really sure why, but from here on out, fuck is an almost every line of dialogue to the point where I'm like everyone needs to stop saying this. I love fuck as a word, but even I am growing weary of it. Yeah, this, is one of those, this is one of those great moments in plot development where where a, a third character shows up at the exact precise time to overhear two other yeah. characters discussing a, 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 a plot twist. Who are yelling their, their motive and their guilt out loud at one another. It's a really smart move. And it's such so, a yeah. boring choice. <sighs> yeah. You, but I think this movie... Only does boring choices <laughs> and bizarre, you know, poking at you, uh, you know, transgressive choices. It just, it doesn't have an in-between. It only has those two extremes. And so you guessed it, Jürgen Prock, Prock now was in on it. Rebecca was guilty all along. 
Frank is still gross, and I hope his wife is going to divorce him into the dark ages. But no, she shows up at the end. <laughs> they all fight. Rebecca gets shot twice. Dr. Paley gets thrown down the stairs. The DA gloats. Sharon shows up for some fucking reason at the end. Yeah. Fuck. See, now <laughs> I'm doing it. Like, like, it's also like she doesn't have a kid at home. She's just going to go out like, you right. know. <laughs> In the middle of the night. It's literally the wee hours of the morning. I hope my husband, who slept around with his murderous defendant, I hope he's okay. Why did they call you? Why did you show up? If you get that call, you're like, thanks for letting me know. Never call me again. <laughs> Hang up. And, and there's just, I mean, I, we all, you know, obviously this entire conversation is about, is about the lack of cleverness overall in this script. But again, mm. like, you know, you're just waiting for something like this is how she's double crossing them both. She's going to get them to kill each other and then run or, you know, like when, once the guy falls off the stairs, she's somehow going to like get rid of Frank. But like, it's just not clever. There's there's just nothing clever. about it. <laughs> no, <laughs> clever is not something that should be mentioned in the same breath of as body of evidence. And also she uh, got away with it. You you know, we we didn't we neglected to mention that as soon as they declare her not guilty, she like right in the courtroom, anyone who could lip read could see it. She leans into his ear and says, "You almost had me convinced." You know, like nobody likes a sore winner. <laughs> Or you could have skipped away with your eight million and no one would have had to know. I know. Jesus. <laughs> uh, why do you got to be such a fucking busybody? Gloat about it right then and there. Just like tamper it down and enjoy your riches. Yeah. But no, she can't do that. Gina, any final notes on this I motion mean, picture? From a modern perspective, it's trying so hard to to be shocking and and it's there's a certain point i you know i am i am not i have nothing against sex graphic sex scenes in a movie i am actually glad that movies are starting to come back that you know they'll have a very adult themes that are and are made for adults your your poor things your salt burn your your uh your infinity pools where where you know it, the, the, it makes no bones that these movies are explicitly for adults but here it's just yeah. it's so like again i i i like I said before, I, it's like a, somebody is aggressively elbowing you, and it's this wild, right? This is so this is so sick. You've never seen anything like this before, right? And it's like, I mean, I, I, sure, you know, it's like, I, it's, it's you, you know, a sex scene is only sexy if, to me if the actors at least make a rudimentary attempt at seeming like they're into each other. Whereas here, it's just mm-hmm. you know, it's some bodies rubbing against each other, aggressively rubbing against each other, and and you know, I just no, no, and and beyond, I mean, and you can tell that that the the the, the trial, the murder mystery, is second to to you. Know, they're they're basically stringing these sex scenes together. And so they don't even really try to create a, a murder mystery that makes any kind of sense that that is you know that holds the audience's attention it, because you could tell it, it does you know, well, you know, well, why does it happen this way it doesn't matter yeah but why wouldn't this person it doesn't matter <laughs> you know it's just like you know, why are you asking that's a stupid question they were hungry they wanted right. a pizza that, that's, that's not what the, that's <laughs> not what this movie's about it's like I thought there's a murder mystery no it's not a murder mystery. Yeah, why why did we find you naked with a bowl of jello? I was hot and I was hungry. That is the combination of what brings us to body of evidence. It just does not add up to anything other than everyone must want more basic instinct, but I think, you know, I basic instinct is fucking the godfather too next to this. And <laughs> I might have a my higher opinion. I mean, than, basic than instinct you do, has Gina, you know, but- a lot of issues with the whole, you know, killer, killer bisexual thing. Um, but, mm. you know, I liked that it doesn't seem to hate Sharon Stone's character. You know, no, it left that to the audience. You know, in America she is, in you know, she is attractive in her confidence. 
and and and, and her intelligence. Yeah. And here, you know, this movie just you know this character. You know, every woman in this in this in this in this movie is terrible. The movie hates her for you know v- variety of reasons. And like again, you know the the you know, Frank the hero. You know, you know, raping Rebecca at one point. I mean, I, I really do think the audience was supposed to come away with that thinking you can't rape someone like that. You know, who's who's into yeah, into that 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 mm. weird sex? You you can't. You know, what do you mean he raped her? He didn't rape her. You can't rape someone who who you know was just that sexually aggressive. It's like no, you actually can. And this is gross. And he's wrong. And the audience should immediately turn off any any lingering. It would, have been, it would have been more satisfying if, as as Tess said earlier, if she had filmed him attacking her, and that that comes back in the end yeah. to bite him in the ass. So yes. It means something, I, and um, you know, but uh, you know, there, and there's with you know with his wife, I you, know, you it's you you sit there like picking through like what you not you know the either the clues they didn't pick up or the ones that like you're not sure if they left, and it's like. She had to work late one night, so that's why his marriage is terrible, and he like she deserves to be cheated on. Like you know, like again, it's these things that don't go anywhere. Like that's why. <laughs> oh, it, it is just so mismanaged on absolutely every level. Which is uh, weird the- because you know usually Hollywood really likes women. <laughs> Yeah, you, you got me there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they've shown it over and over again, uh, and no recent events would ever tell us otherwise. No. So um, it's great, problem solved. Yeah. Um, and so, of course, uh, we can't really wrap up this particular case without choosing our own death venture, and that is where we decide of the deaths in this particular film. If we were forced to die that way, which one would we choose and why? There's unfortunately only two deaths to choose from here. And that is fucked to death on cocaine or shot twice in the chest, defenestrated and fallen to the Pacific. Tess, as our guest, I ask for you to go first. I'm going to have to go with fucked to death. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't, it's not as glamorous as getting shot to death and defenestrated out of a second story window is. I mean, and it would Fuck be. Fuck to I death mean, on cocaine seems more pleasurable. While it, you know, like while it would be pretty sweet to live in the boathouse, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, yeah. Your exit from your exit from the boathouse does leave a little to be desired. And, uh, and he lived Gina, in a mansion, so it's not like his place was all that shabby either. Oh no! If you if you want a movie that has stairs in it. Guess what? I've got a movie for you. It's Body of Evidence. It's got a lot of stairs. <laughs> you <laughs> Gina, know, I you? would I would initially say fuck to death, but at the same time, I mean, I would at least I would at least hope it would be quick because I, I feel like sure. you know a heart attack is painful. You're scared. I mean, yeah, it, it's nice that you know you're you know you're going out in a big way, but but I, I don't know. So I think I actually would take shot and falling off a houseboat. No, okay. Well, these are two very compelling arguments, and then you get to look uh, all Lady of Shalott, exactly, you know? but, but, with, <laughs> but with you know my nipples plainly visible through fabric, <laughs> the way we all want to go, <laughs> exactly. it nips out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah i mean that is uh, uh, yes yeah, I, I i think i'm just gonna go with fuck to death on cocaine i it it does uh it does seem scary to a certain degree but you know what a way to go and also you're out of this movie so fast <laughs> that's true that that is also true like you you don't even have to really act much like you're you are on the call sheet for a day day and a half tops and then you just reap the benefits of having appeared in you know, it's, body it's of always evidence. better to be talked about more often than you're actually seen. So it, yeah, that is a good point. Yeah. You know what's it's funny too about Madonna's death scene is Dr. Paley, right? He gets knocked over a balcony and you're meant to think breaks his neck or whatever. But but not only did he not break his neck, he clearly is not, you know, injured enough that he can't come up the stairs with no one hearing him. And fire off two shots directly to her chest. Yeah. <laughs> but then having killed Madonna, um, he doesn't go after Willem Defoe's character. He's like, you're a cool guy. <laughs> like, he leaves a witness. 
<laughs> right. Like he helped ruin your career. Why not turn the gun? Like if he had also been shot that, then I would have gone, listen, it was a rough go for 135 minutes, but in the last two minutes, they pulled it out. Everybody. It's it's like, yeah, he's just going to leave the witness and be like, no, it's fine. I'll come yeah, to it's cool. <laughs> I have no beef with you, man. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely have beef with them. Bros before hoes. <laughs> On that note, I think it is time to say goodbye. Uh, Tess, where can people uh, hear more from you, read more from you? Uh, you know, where can you be found? Oh, you can. Well, um, if you're interested in what I have to say about current events every week, you can pick up my Substack. Uh, it's tessrafferty.substack.com. You can find my books, the Cat Kelly Mystery Series, um, on Amazon. And um, yeah, that's, and you can find me on TikTok. Uh, my handle's Tess Rafferty. Uh, and you can find me on Instagram at Cat Kelly Mystery. Excellent. Uh, Gina, where can people find you on these here? Internets? I too have a sub stack. It's Gina watches things dot sub stack dot com. And I am on all social medias except uh, Twitter X under Gina does things. Do it today. People check it out. Uh, you can find us on uh, the Patreons uh, where we have lots of bonus episode fun for you to, to see and hear. And of course, uh, Josh Hollis has all our artwork. Go to Revenge Body Memphis for this uh, Revenge Body Memphis at Bandcamp.com for this remix and all our other mixes of our theme song. Uh, that rate and review us on iTunes or the podcatcher of your choice. It helps be seen and heard by more people. That pretty much does it for this episode, but do not worry, folks. The body count will continue with an absolute blockbuster episode of HBO's The Hitchhiker. <laughs> oh my goodness. If you thought the first Hitchhiker episode was good, wait. And it was. Uh, this one is a doozy. So look forward to that. Don't worry, folks. The body count will continue for myself, for Gina and Tess. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.